Today in the studio business, from home studios to the big houses, we have the preeminent expert to help you make decisions. We're heading to Nashville to do some teaching at the Blackbird Academy. We'll share those dates. Dave's got a brand new ITL. I'm going to try my hand at some German in today's show. It is just a Yahoo fest. Let's go. You're at the place. It's Pensado's place. <laughs> <laughs> Was ist los? Yeah, whatever that means. Wie geht's es Ihnen? That's it. I'm okay, done. Good, good, good. Mic drop. A We're couple out. of cuss words like Scheiss cough and I'm done. Oh, no, I can't go there. <laughs> How are you, man? Man, we got like a celebrity packed uh, facility today. We do? We do. What celebs are here? Bruce Roberts, my buddy. Absolutely. He qualifies as packing the place. He's the, that big. Just by himself. Yeah. A yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, sit down, Bruce. Okay, we're ready. How was your week, sir? Man, um... They're always great, yeah. so I can't deny that. Um, I slept for the last two days, so that's kind of a neat that's thing. That's rare. This is a different energy coming off you. I, I'm, I'm digging that sleep stuff. It's amazing, isn't it? it, it it's a new concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it does yeah. work. How about you? What's up with you? Good, good, good. You know, we're in live event planning mode. We've got all the stuff. That's, it's 2016, so we're about to rock and roll. You ready for it? I am. Uh, me too. I want to get I it am. done. So. We're, we're going to our favorite places, right, this year? We again. are. Shall okay. we talk about it? I don't know why I said that. I kind of knew. I, don't, but I just want to make sure. But you just confirm it. Yeah, yeah. Shall, shall we talk about let's it? Let's do it. All right, let's go. Uh, hi, gang. Uh, everything good out there in the audio world? Thank you for the privilege of being back with you. We certainly appreciate that. Big ups for your likes and subscribes. Keep those going if you would. Again, most appreciated. Our partners, the Blackbird Academy, the Vintage King, the Audio Technica, the Aftermaster, the Isotope, the Fab Factory, the Recording Studio, and finally, the Avid. They've never had all those does in front of them before. <laughs> They're in a new place. Uh, they are the absolute best. Please support them if you would. They support us and allow this show to come to you for free. Uh, DP, you were, we were alluding to this just a few seconds ago. We've been summoned to teach at the Blackbird Academy in Nashville. Yeah. It's going to be on Friday. Don't get scared about this. Let me write this down. Okay, Friday, May 13th. I'm cool with that. Friday the 13th. So the only deal I worked out with Karma was make sure we don't have to travel on Friday the 13th. We'll have to talk on Friday the 13th, but we're going to yeah. do that anyways. Let me ask you a question. If, if, if I say Friday the 13th to myself in Spanish, is it still bad luck in another language? No, or is it it's brand new. English? Clears it. Oh, cool. Clears it. So, right. And if you hold a black cat and stroke it while you do that? It reverses the whole system. Should we do that? I next pray week? to the recording guys that we edit this little section out. No, we're going <laughs> to keep that in. But speaking of Blackbird Academy, so we're going to take that whole day. Yeah. You'll take some of it. I'll take some of it, and yeah. we will. Um, and we're going to take the kids out to eat. Well, not kids. It's the students out yeah. to eat and hang, and just that Blackbird experience. Don't we take both... Chango. We're on no. a budget when we travel. No, don't take Chango. Can't go. <laughs> uh, Chango will eat you out of the house at home, by the way. Um, but Chango, just the black Chango workers. went to Japan and three environmental groups went crazy. Yeah, absolutely. It depleted <laughs> most of the Pacific I, stock of salmon. There is no more blue tin, <laughs> blue fin tuna. <laughs> Chango ate it all. Talk about the Blackbird Academy and just our well, experience when, being, when we're there. Um, one of the things that Herman and I really like to do is, is and I've said this before, we, we like seeing the people that watch the show. We like interacting with you guys. And Blackbird gives us a unique... Um, opportunity to talk to students and, and, and people starting their careers and we find out what they like and and I think I learn more from them than they learn from me. It, mm -hmm. It's just a wonderful thing uh, what John McBride has done down there because it's different than the other schools in the sense that um, that you're working at a major facility. You, you get to see the, all the biggest stars in the world, you do. not just country but every genre mm -hmm. uh, coming around and you get to actually learn in, in facilities that I work at. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. that's, Studio D is my favorite down mm -hmm. there. It's just an amazing and, place. And, and education elevates when it's combined with passion. And it's really hard mm -hmm. to find people who care. There are other people who care. Mm -hmm. Listen, we, we have great institutions we know at Berkeley and other folks. Yeah. The guys at Blackbird really care. You get, I think, a boutique sort of focus, because there's 26 seats, mm -hmm. 
and but you get big time exposure and mm. their placement service is ridiculous. Um, Let me ask you something. Beat. Yeah. When I was playing in bands a lot, um, we'd, we'd start, a, we'd start this, the, the show and our energy was high. If, if the crowd reciprocated that energy, mm -hmm. we went to another level together. And, and you and I t talk as much as we can to student groups. Mm -hmm. and, and I've noticed that, that that energy that we get back from them allows us to get more, give more back. Yeah. And the Blackbird students are, are always enthusiastic. They're like little sponges. They want to absorb, mm -hmm. which makes us want to do more and give more and, 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 and take more time I think, with them. And I think that's true of every teacher that comes down there. Mark and Kevin and Carmen, the guys who mm -hmm. run on a day-to-day -day basis, they teach that way. Guests, we, we've had a lot of guests who end up being guest professors there, mm -hmm. and they all want to go because there's an, that exchange and people that care. And also there's such a broad, broad swath of students, it's not 18 year olds, it's 18 to 50. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's male like and that. female, yeah. it's people who really care about it. So we're gonna be down there, Dave will do all the kind of stuff that will help you with your career. I will have discussions about your business approach and making crucial management decisions. Um, get in that April class post haste, still a few slots open. Veterans, keep this in mind. They now have the VA designation and they are ready to serve you. Thank you for serving us. Your service is invaluable, and we want to make sure we recognize it. To our international fans, if you can, get to Nashville. It's an amazing musical city. As Dave alluded to, every genre is represented. Sign up at the Blackbird Academy, and your career boost will blow you away. We're there May 13th. All you have to do is go to karma at theblackbirdacademy.com. It's posted right here, right below me, and you will have a good time. Funny thing happened to me last night. Quick segue. Mm -hmm. I'm in Gelson's at the salad bar. Mm -hmm. Gentleman walks by me and goes around the corner to another aisle. I hear from another aisle, I love your show. <laughs> he runs back around and we have this really interesting discussion. His name is Dave Avila. He works for Univision. Oh, yeah. I said, oh, we want to shoot Univision. And we just had this really interesting discussion about the marketplace, the Latin markets, marketplace, um, the approach to audio, how they think about things. And so he's going to get in touch with us, and I think we could create some some interesting stuff. We want to do a deeper oh, dive man. in that space, don't you think? Yeah, I love Univision. I, I, I'm a little sad that uh, Don Francisco isn't there anymore because I used to watch that every Saturday without the sound. Oh, I'm sorry. What? Don Francisco's not there anymore. Oh, you scared me. I'm like, what, what <laughs> no, I, I, was just, I was lamenting. Damn, that scared the hell out of me. Well, don't, don't do um, that. But that network is, is really underrated. The, the, the novellas, the little uh, soap operas they do are as big in South American countries as mm -hmm. they are in Russia. They're translated mm -hmm. in Russian. It's mm -hmm. just a wonderful network. Mm -hmm. And, and um, they do a great service to a lot of Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, um, that and Telemundo. So shout out to Dave Avila. We'll be in touch with him soon. Um, Here's a quick audio tidbit before we get to introduce the ITL. So I'm reading around, I'm searching around, <clears throat> and I see where a 3D printer had made something, I forget, and somebody had recorded the audio noise coming off of it. And obviously with the technology, you can, you can record that exact. And they literally could put in the audio files into another 3D printer and have it replicate with the first really? 3D printer. Yeah, that's Which, so cool. Well, it's cool, but it also has bad implications too. If you're making something bad and you don't know that the sound is being lifted, somebody can copy your copyright stuff and go on and make things. It was interesting to see how audio was used. Just who would have known that? Because it's just you know we went and took a tour of. Uh, Ultimate Ears, and they had 3D printers. Oh, yeah, that's remember, impressive. And we could hear the sounds. Just think of somebody was recording that and didn't know and then lifted their copyright and their content and all of a sudden could make it someplace else. Upside and downside to it. That's, audio. I, I'm still, th um, I got to think about that. Audio in the middle. Let's take a little 30-minute break. <clears throat> think about that. Maybe not 30 minutes. <laughs> We're back. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. That's, pretty, that's pretty amazing. You know, it points out a bigger problem, too, in that technology is, is forcing old laws to be rethought, oh, absolutely. and uh, it's about time that the government uh, took some of that stuff seriously from, from archaic copyright laws to archaic compensation laws to archaic um, printer laws. It's, we're, in the, we're in the first industrial revolution that will never stop. There are industrial revolutions that had a period and mm -hmm. then we adopted. That's a great point. It's never going to change. Um, <clears throat> so great intros to our corner office are coming in. We love that. 
Uh, fans in Germany, bear with me. Henrik Jürgen sent in these description of Changor. Okay, you ready for this? I, uh, you know more than you'll ever know. I'm ready for this. Hervorlangenden, Heroschen, Hakmodernen, and Hebelgeiten. I'm going to do that again. Okay, ready? Hervorlangenden, Heroschen, Hakmodernen, Mordornen. I think that's the way you say it. And Hebelgeiten. They mean excellent, heroic, very modern, and beloved which is no description of John Gore whatsoever. <laughs> or or as, as, let me Americanize it, as we would say, <laughs> horny, hungry, and in a hurry. <laughs> yeah. um, audience, let's wait, give, wait, 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 uh, wait, wait, let's wait, give wait. Herb a round of applause for that. That, that was an amazing effort. Damn, Herb. Thank you. And I don't think you got a, a syllable right. That was so amazing. <laughs> I, I really did. And, and they played they played the pronunciation for me about 10 seconds ago. That's how difficult it was. But, but much like Ross Hogarth, you, you committed, man. You commit, man. You got to commit. <laughs> so let's introduce him properly. He okay. holds during the corner office, and he is horny, hungry, and hairy. And he goes by the name of... John Gore. <laughs> Respond to that, homie. <laughs> I came to the army. There are too many people no, here. Okay. We need a we need a new arm raise. Oh man. So, uh, are you heroic and beloved? I I would hope so. Uh, what I noticed they didn't have in there was the German word for endowed. <laughs> so you know that's that's between you and your girlfriend. But anyways, I'll take it. Got good got good questions for our guests. Really what, great what, questions. What is that word? Something schlagen. Huh? Something schlagen. No schlagen. No schlagen. <laughs> Little schlagen. Uber schlagen. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, as, one, this one on a whole different path. <laughs> yeah, the show is completely derailed, which is which is perfect. Um, you know, in guys your age, in terms of what you do, and you just came out of audio school about eight months ago. Um, there's always a question of what you do with your gear, where you're going to mix. Do you work work at home? Do you try to get into a major studio? So the studio business has some relevance to oh. what to decisions you make career wise. Com correct? Completely. Completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, this is going to be a good one because the cat we got is the dude. The dude. All right, we'll be back to you, Chongor. Cool. Uh, DP, what's the what's the uh, this week's ITL? Well, I'm gonna give you a little, a little background. I um, I went went in, took a peek. At, you know, Leandro, my assistant, Leandro Hidalgo, has his own room, and I stuck my head in. and I'm like, what the hell is that? What are you doing? And he was working on some pads. Did you, did you say it at that high frequency, or did you roll off to F sharp? I went all the way up to okay, F sharp. Okay, cool, cool, cool. And um, and I said, man, that make a great ITL. You want to do an ITL? Because yeah, sure. And so this is what I, this is what he was doing. Check oh, cool. it out. Let's roll it. Hey guys, my name is Leandro Hidalgo and uh, I'm Dave Pensado's assistant. Uh, my client asked me to mix one of these songs and uh, I was mixing it and I felt like the downbeat was so important and the uh, pads that came in weren't necessarily strong on the downbeat and uh, I kind of wanted to emphasize that. Uh, while I was mixing it, Dave came in and he thought it was a great, uh, that was a great little thing to do there so he asked me to do an ITL on it so uh, here it is. So this is the song. As you see, the downbeats are kind of important when it comes to the song, just for the feel and the vibe and, you know, the intensity of it when it comes in. So I'll show you what I did. Um, so here I have this pad. And I felt like the downbeats of that pad could have been a little more emphasized. So I have three different ways here to do it. The first one I'll show you is using, um, using DD DDMF to wrap. Uh, kickstart by Nicky Romero and basically all this is doing is side chaining to only allow you know the downbeat to come through so this is what it sounds like so once you have that um, I could show you this is just what it's doing on its own so after I got that sound, I went ahead and uh, you know adjusted the volume here to kind of mix it back in as a parallel. Um, another easy way to do it in case you don't have that plug-in, uh, these are just stock plugins um, with the Saturn here, but this is just your average gate. Um, so what I did was I took a kick drum sample and uh, I put the output of the kick drum sample to the side chain of the gate. So only when the kick drum 
side chain to the gate will the gate open and I put them on every downbeat so this is what it sounds like and together with the pad. So it kind of helps emphasize a little bit on the downbeat to help the intensity of that uh, come in. And same thing, I just went ahead and mixed it back in. Um, if you want to take it a step further, what you could do is kind of add a saturator to it. This is uh, one of my favorite saturators, uh, Saturn by Fab Filter. So basically I just add a little more grit to the downbeat. And the last way that I can show you on how to do it is very simple. This is if you don't have any plugins at all, what you could really do is just use automation. So what I, what I did here was I created a send to an aux track and uh, I used the automation here. As you can see, I didn't do it so sharp, so it had a kind of a nice little decaying tail, but um, this is what it sounds like. And so since I use the volume automation to do the, just the downbeats, um, I had to mix it back in to a, you know, a good level so it wasn't so obvious. So I just went ahead and put trim on here, but that's not necessary. You can just bypass trim, highlight these guys here and just bring them all down. Same thing. But yeah, so, um, you know, if you guys have any questions, always feel free to hit us up. We'll answer anything that we can and try to help out as much as possible. Cool. So uh, this song was by Nick Santori. The song's called You Already Know. It's on his SoundCloud page. Uh, it's produced by Dennis Koshak. Feel free to go check it out and let me know what you think. After an illustrious career at major studios as an engineer, worked on some incredible records, our guest decided to step into a niche and made it really all his own. There is no one on the planet who knows more about the studio business than this man. He is a good friend. He's a good friend of the audio industry. Mm -hmm. We've known him forever. He's been around forever. A smart guy. Please welcome to the desk the one, the only, Ellis Sorkin. How are you, man? Excellent. Good, good, good to see you, man. Good, 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 good. Dave. Good. I remember when I first moved to LA, of course, you, I think you were one of the first people I met, but Ellis had to be like second or third because I, I knew nothing about the studios. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I had to eat and shower, so I had to know which studios had the best food in the lounge that I could sneak and eat for free. And, and, and have the best in. laboratory so that I could. <laughs> oh, absolutely. We could and shower. by the way, he, he, he still does that. So if you need a place to live or sleep or eat, just give Ellis a call. Okay. But dude, how many, what, what have you been doing this? Like 35 years now? Yeah, a little more than that. Is that right? Yeah, just wow. slightly over, yeah. Wow. You yeah. have seen every change in yeah. the last almost 40 years. Yeah. And they've been wrenching changes, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So in the early, so go start at the early years. You, what what brought you to audio and engineering and that okay. kind of stuff? Okay. Excellent. Um, when I was born, believe it or not, mm -hmm. my parents went to a Red Cross school, and really? to learn how to do the diapering and all that kind of crap or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they met a couple that were named Dave and Marilyn Alpert. Wow. Okay? And Who Dave Alpert's son, Herb. No, older brother, kidding. yes, is Herb. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And they were having, their son was Randy. Yeah. Okay. And we grew up with them. They were, became best friends. I'll be done. And um, when I was about 13, 14 years old, my dad took me over to the studios. And I sat in on a session. That was this it. This would be A&M? A&M. That was it. Back in Studio C, there was a session going on with Claudine Langer wow. and Andy Williams. Wow. And I just was sort of intrigued, and he picked up on that. And he got me onto what was their waiting list to become an apprentice. They had... Trainees, a, a trainee, didn't they call yeah. They had a program there that yeah. was the finest in the world. Mm. Okay, I mean, it was, they trained people to become the elite of the elite. Mm. We went through people every week or two. If you had the wrong attitude, the wrong anything, you screw up anything, you were out. Mm. Okay, and mm. they put up with nothing. And you started at the bottom, you're making the coffee, you're, yep. you know, washing the everything. And then eventually you get up to the point where you're going to start to set up sessions. Yep. And, you do the setups and... How long from apprentice to where you were actually engineering on your own? Actually, the first gig I did was a year later. That's pretty fast. It was, I was actually the fastest and youngest at the time. I'd to say, do it. that's pretty cool. And um, I got very lucky in that uh, one of the gigs that I assisted on was a guy named Sean Phillips, mm -hmm. who was an artist on A&M. Mm -hmm. And um, he 
I assisted on the first album. The second album came around, and they asked me if I would do it. Wow. And wow. it was pretty intimidating at the time, but sure. it was like, okay, you know. And see, back then, that happened more often than not. My buddy Richard Dashett, that happened with him with Fleetwood Mac. Mm -hmm. He was... He was just an in, he was an intern of sweeping things. He sat in on something, and somebody didn't show up one day, and he tried it. And then the band said, "Well, we'll give you a shot." And it turned out that that shot was on Tusk or something, yeah. something huge enough. So you're engineering. You're now you've gotten past the intimidation stage. Right. You end up working with some pretty big name artists. Was that to, was that another level in your growth in terms of how to manage that process? Well, the way that it worked was you were part of a group of assistants mm -hmm. still. Okay, mm -hmm. even if you were engineering, there were senior engineers there and then there were the junior, let's say. Uh. Okay. And the juniors were pretty much assistants. Of course, back in that day, everybody that is everything an assistant did was what engineers are doing now, pretty right. much. I mean like right. we were doing aligning the tape machines, you know, sometimes with the help of the shop. Sure. We would be setting up everything. We would to the point that everything was plugged in so that when the engineer came in, all he had to do was ride the fader. That's it. That was about it's it. Good to you go. know, maybe he tweaked the limiter a little bit. Yeah. Wow. But like I would know exactly what whoever that was mm -hmm. needed and wanted. Mm -hmm. And you'd hook up with these people for long times. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would be, I worked with Henry Louis, uh, who was the Joni Mitchell guy. Right. And um, Hank Sacalo, who oh, was uh, Lou Adler's guy for everything that Lou Adler ever did. Absolutely. I so I was that. his guy. And Al Schmidt. The studio out in Santa Monica. Yeah, That's exactly. A brother recording, yep. which was the Beach Boys place way back on Fourth Street. Exactly. Oh my exactly. God. Exactly. Yeah. He we bought that with Tom Scott. My buddy. Yeah, exactly. And, and Tom, of course, I worked with at uh, all the Joni Mitchell stuff and the George Harrison stuff. That oh, I worked amazing. On with because Tom was the guy. You know? So so old records was around that yes, time period. exactly. We had There were incredible the names. Who were some of the names involved with old records? Well, with Ode, obviously Cheech and Chong. Sure. And uh, Mary Clayton. Mm hmm And um, Richard T. I oh. think had a, a, a deal with them for a while. I worked for Richard T. Yeah. That's how my career started. And of course, the Rocky Horror Picture Show, mm -hmm. which I was able to assist on some of that stuff. Wow. And obviously, the biggest name, Carol King. Sure, sure. Uh, and then you got Quincy Jones and other folks. Yeah, Quest, Quest and Records other folks was there. The Quest wow. was there. And, you know, he had Quincy would use the studios. I worked on some of the Roots project as the assistant for part of that. And uh, of course, uh, um, George Harrison had his label there too, Dark Horse. Oh, that's right. That's right. And so was able to work with all these different people that were on the lot, as well as tons of independent artists that would use A and M because A and M, in its day, was pretty much as world class as it got. Yeah, it yeah. was. In fact, I think they kind of pioneered that type of facility too, where the, the kind of compound, <coughs> you know, the, the service line. and all yeah. that. Right. Stuff. Exactly. Yeah. We had five studios basically. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna get out of, out of chronological order just to show our audience the importance of what you do. Um, a lot of people don't don't have the time to to, um, to do the research to find a facility. Recently, Lady Gaga went on the road, and she recorded um, "Born That Way" over the course of a year. And you had to find her 23 studios in in different parts of the world or different parts of America, different parts of the world. So you booked and got her deals on all those studios, right? And that's what the man does for a living. That's well, like amazing. Well, explain explain now. So you so you have your engineering thing. Right. Seems like as an entrepreneur, you saw a niche in the marketplace. Yes. You looked at the city. And then so you, you started what and what has it become involved? Okay, involved what happened into? was back in 1980, yep. I was hanging out in the front office at the studio. And a lady named Cheryl Ingalls, who was the tape librarian, was reading Billboard. Mm -hmm. And she's reading this article about a guy who was the road manager of Genesis at the time. I don't remember his name, mm -hmm. sorry. But he was buying up downtime from the studios in London and then reselling it to up and coming bands at you know, a discount so that they could afford to go in and record. Mm. Obviously way before Pro Tools was even a concept, everything was two inch sure. or one inch, whatever. And so that just sort of gave me an idea. It was like, hmm, wouldn't it be cool if there was some kind of like a, a clearinghouse where people could call up like a booking service and find specifically what they need. Mm -hmm. You know, do I need, uh, am I tracking a whole band? Am I just doing a voiceover? Am I doing overdubs or whatever? Because I saw a lot of waste at A&M while I was there too. It's like I was, sometimes we'd be doing demos in the morning, which was okay because that was part of the Almo Irving sure. publishing company, which we owned anyway. Right. But there'd be people doing voiceovers for things that could be done in much smaller kind of facilities. Right home studios if they existed, which they hadn't quite started at that point, but mm. they're starting, the idea was there. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought, why not have a place where people could get what 
fit best what they needed financially, mm -hmm. technically, location, mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Did it take off? Did it take what off? happened was it did pretty quickly. Actually. Yeah, <coughs> did I, it really? I, the first step was gathering the studios. I went to, sure. at the time, the ten majors, which there were pretty much, and everybody was pretty much online with going with it right away. Wow. There's one exception, which was a pretty major place, and uh, the owner at the time said, it's a stupid idea, it'll never work. Mm. And later became a partner with me in, <laughs> did he really, it yes, in another venture where he had his own private thing called World Studio Group. That's how it's Dave, Chris Stone. Oh, he doesn't right, mind. Right. At this point, we're friends. Record and, plant. Yeah, record plant. Yeah. Exactly. That's how Dave felt when I came to the Alpine Silas place. He said, ah, oh, this shit's stupid. It'll never work. <laughs> I didn't say that. No, you did not. I just, said, I just said the name was crappy and you need a better host. That's all I said. <laughs> <laughs> That's that. So it's, uh, what I find interesting about that, and which we'll get to, is that you know, vision is something that you sometimes just have to have your eyes open. Right. Sometimes it just lays itself out in front of you. You have to, you know, have the courage to go after it. Right. And back mm -hmm. then, the, the studio environment was, we met in the lobby of a studio. Mm -hmm. Skip Sailor, we were oh, talking yeah, about sure. that. Yeah. yeah. And so the, the environment was thriving at the time. But essentially what you did for the studio is to say, I'll help book your rooms. Right. Why exactly. wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you want that service? Right. Because I know, for, as a manager, it was much easier for me if I had an issue to call you. Right. And then I got such professional treatment. So this takes off. Are you doing this with a bunch of staff? Are you doing the research yourself? In the beginning, well, the research myself in the very beginning, yeah, just yeah. to get the the basic studios that we had, and they they grew exponentially as far as once word got out. Oh, hey, man, we got this project from them, and you know, right. they tell this guy that you know, and so forth. Right. And initially, it was just in California, but then eventually it became national. And then it became international probably in the last 20 years or so, no 15 joke. or 20 years. Yeah. The internet had a lot to do with it. Because Helped greatly. Long distance, Absolutely. Distance Especially with something like that Lady Gaga album. Yeah, you know, long because, distance phone calls well, became affordable too. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, there was a time when it was $5 a minute to call the UK Yee. even, you know. So it was like in the beginning and it was like, you right. know. I had to weigh, is this worth doing, you know, to be on the phone for a half hour to discuss <laughs> what are all this? What are my margins <laughs> Profit here? margins, exactly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Another yeah. thing that changed, it seems like back then, Different people would do the booking and call you than they do now. Explain that. It's changed over the years, yeah. yeah. In the very beginning, um, God, so long ago, uh, the very beginning, this was before managers existed, yeah. okay, before producer, engineer managers mm -hmm. became huge. Mm -hmm. I think the earlier calls came directly from the labels to a degree, yeah. and also there was something called a production coordinator. Absolutely. Those people were the earliest Those were the clients, yeah, okay? Absolutely. And then the producer, engineer, managers became huge mm -hmm. and became my biggest clients. Right, gotcha. I mean, in the beginning, it was like uh, Michael Lipman yep. and Steve Moyer, guys like that. Oh, and then yeah. their companies grew and sure. grew. And then they had offshoots like Bennett Kaufman yep. and Frank McDonough all became clients. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, at one point or another, those people had so many clients mm -hmm. that needed studios. Mm -hmm. And everybody had two-inch tape or Sony Digital at wow. the time. So no, there were no home studios. So everybody had to use me. Amazing. You know, or they could find it themselves, of course, if they tried, but right. whatever. Why? Why do it was that? a lot easier to get specific with Absolutely. me and say, hey, we want an old Neve and we want to have you know, this kind of room and we want to be in this location and this is our budget. What do you recommend? So yeah, I'm using a bad analogy here, but in, in, in a way you're sort of like a tailor mm -hmm. and you will customize this suit to the fit of the client, correct? Right. And as home studios and other things come up, or whatever the technological changes are, or the, or the evolutions of things, you then have to adjust the way you tailor, right? And then be able to provide. Is that is that now? That's happened fair? over the years, exactly as technology has changed over the years. Sure, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll be darn. Ellis, what is there? Uh, I have an answer in my head, so see if you can get it right. Right. Um, I got that. <laughs> <laughs> I work with you a lot. And by the way, sometimes I use, I use metaphor and analogy wrong. I'm glad Herb did that so mm -hmm. I can study from that because I do. Anyway, what, what, what one thing do you think, if you had to name one thing, transitioned and made that transition from the big major studios and now suddenly people can do some things at home? What do you think made that possible first? Well, probably, no probably Pro Tools really is where yeah. it became more... You don't able. think like the half inch? Eight. Well, no, that was the transition. Of course, a yeah. half inch eight track, yeah. quarter inch four track before that even. Yeah. Quarter inch four track, half yeah, inch eight track, track, you know, then the D88s Dats. and the ADATs <laughs> yeah. and all that kind yeah. of stuff. That was the, the progression yeah. that happened. But I think that in the beginning, when you had all those lower end formats, yeah. it really wasn't the same sonically. You know, mm -hmm. it just really, they couldn't compete mm -hmm. with 
what was going on. Once it hit ADAT and D88, yeah. yes, more so. But I had an 80 8 that was pretty damn good. A lot of that stuff made it to, to the final that's record. That's because it was in the right hands. You know, no. you, you knew what you were doing. Thanks. You know, a lot of people were buying them because they could buy them. Just like that now to sense. a degree too. It's like yeah. a lot of times a trend that I've been seeing is like people can buy Pro Tools, they get it, and they know how to they learn how to use it and they think they're an engineer. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not, it's not the same thing. That's right. You know, That's there, right. there's definitely a talent to being an engineer as a being a mixer. Mixers yeah. didn't exist in the beginning when I started this right. company. So, it was I just recording that. engineers. Everybody was a recording yeah. engineer. Wow. Right? When I was starting my career in Atlanta, I just thought you went in on Monday made a record and left the following weekend. I, yep. that's, that's the way we did it back then. But, right? to, your, but to your point, um, oftentimes there's a balance between technology harming you and helping you. Sure, you, you have to control the technology, not have the technology control you. Is Absolutely. that a fair, fair statement? Absolutely, yeah. And, and so now that, so in today's, well, as you're coming through the, the evolutionary phase of this, um, we go from Pro Tools entering, now we've got software where people can do things. Right. So their needs for space and monitors and all that stuff, does that change? It has, yeah, dramatically. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people these days are working strictly in the box mm -hmm. and or, and then doing it anywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a matter of fact, the, the Gaga album that happened after Born This Way, which was actually quite a few years already, I think that's like mm -hmm. five years ago, that yeah, record was. Yeah, about right. And so there have been one or two since then. Um, the, the one, the last one, I believe, was done largely in hotel rooms yeah. on a laptop. Yep. We hear that a lot. Yeah. You I mean, the mixing book, was not. Do you book hotel rooms no. for people? <laughs> I have, but not for that, no. But they, but they did mix oh, it, I think, largely with the record. Wait plan. a minute. No, you can't just yeah. toss that out. Like, <laughs> like, he did step over that IED. Yeah. Yeah. Like, why are you booking hotel rooms? Well, what happens is once in a while. If this ain't well, juicy, we'll move yeah, on. Yeah, no, we, no, it's, 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 it's juicy. It, it's juicy. <laughs> what happens is once in a while, we'll have a client that'll be, let's say, coming here from someplace in Europe and uh, or wherever and they want to work at a studio that's in X part of town and they need a, need a place to stay nearby there mm -hmm. and it's a long enough project and maybe a big enough artist that will hook them up with sure. wherever gotcha. it is get get something settled in to meet the budget or whatnot. Are prostitutes involved? Yes, sometimes. Oh, good. Okay, good. It's still rock and roll, and I like it. Not like that, the old that, days when it was more was drugs my, than prostitutes. I was about to catch a predator moment. I got you. And, and you've been caught. I've been studying like... <laughs> you've been, been caught. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> that said, one of the things that we talked about recently is that one of the current trends are really destination studios. Yes. People have homes, they convert, they go there, they actually stay there and they record there. Is that, tell us about that. That has been a big trend in the last several years, but mm. it started, I think, back with the Chili Peppers. So we used to do all their earlier records way back in the old days, really like a Beinhorn and Laurel all that, Canyon. the Laurel Canyon thing. That was probably mm. the first that I know of, yeah. like, even though that wasn't technically really a studio at the time, they made it a studio. Wasn't right. there a studio in Montreal like that that, that Bowie used for one of the? I believe labors? you're right. Yeah, I believe Beautiful. you're right. All glass. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I remember about that. Beautiful I had. Studio. We could ask the Lander guy. He's here. We'll, we'll find that out. So the so <laughs> so the trend started with this. Yes. Yeah. With and and do these places exist? Do they have to yes. be converted or? Well, what happens is this: people saw this going on. Okay. And uh, we have, there's only about four or five of them in LA. Okay. Um, and they've become so popular lately. It's like I've done almost more business with that really? than with anything else. And what they are is different levels. There's like the most basic one is one that I think I mentioned to you in Largemont mm -hmm. Village, which yes. is a cool little bungalow house, two, three bedrooms, yeah. whatever. A separate <clears throat> building that has the studio and it's nicely equipped. <clears throat> yeah. And it's <clears throat> affordable. It's yeah. the same kind of money as if you went to like a B level studio mm -hmm. and here you have lodging. Mm hmm and a studio, mm -hmm. and backline, mm -hmm. which is nice too. Amazing. And then there's another level up, which is a place that we have in the Hollywood Hills that's beautiful. Each It's like a four bedroom house wow. that each bedroom has views of the city, mm. and it's just gorgeous, gorgeous. Yeah. okay? And people hang there, and we've had big clients that we started, I think when they first started out, we did some 41 there, mm. and we did Band of Horses, and Lately, though, we've been doing a lot of urban acts there. Like we did J. Cole we had okay. there for three months. Sure. Uh, Erica Badu. Sure. Um, lately, uh, um, uh, Bryson Tiller, oh, Travis yeah. Scott. Of, Absolutely. And they go there, and these people stay there for a long time. They're not there for a week. It's like a month, two months, whatever, which is great mm -hmm. because most studios aren't getting those kind of bookings. Right. But now this kind of opportunity is better for the client because they have this great place to stay. Mm -hmm. They can make their own hours. Mm -hmm. And... The way the gear is these days, mm -hmm. you know, everything being largely Pro Tools or whatever, they don't have to have 
you know, some of the big name rooms to necessarily track at. Maybe they'll go do there and do some of their bigger overdubs. Right. And from a funding standpoint, if you're a label or if you're the artist, you're getting more bang for your buck. Absolutely. For the same money yeah, you're paying. They like, they like, they like a, a, a fixed price. They like a manageable they do. known price. Right. Back when mm -hmm. we started out, there was, was the no wild, wild west. And I'm exactly. sure a lot of people had heart attacks this, when they this saw gives my you, bills. This gives you lodging, cuts yep. down transportation, exactly. food Absolutely. is already built in, mm -hmm. and recording is going on. Absolutely. Yeah. Another, yeah. another trend, and tell me if I'm wrong, um, in the early 90s, I would go into facilities and they, they, they weren't able to accommodate the urban world that I was in. We, we used a, a lot of patch cables, just a lot of little things. And um, I guess it would be fair to say they weren't really too accommodating a lot of times to the urban world. And now that's the biggest client base Absolutely. there is, is the urban world. You Absolutely. don't do urban, you ain't in business exactly. now. It's Absolutely. really changed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that, there, is that accurate? There was even a period where some studios were really trying to avoid it. Hundred yeah, percent. Yeah, but I'm not going to name names, but I, yeah. I went to one studio and they made me rent patch cables to do a song that I did for you that actually sold like ten million copies in a week. Uh -huh. But I had to rent my own patch cables. Wow. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out where my royalty statement is for that. <laughs> I don't remember that. Um, so so. So that's sort of studio B and B as as opposed to Airbnb. Yeah, exactly. Right? Cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it's become a whole sector of what we do. It's, it's probably amazing. about fifteen, twenty percent of what I'm doing almost at the, this point. The other thing we notice a lot based on our guests and the, what we hear from our audience is and you alluded to it earlier, people are recording on the move. Right. So whether Alex did stuff on the train and mm -hmm. he had you know, somebody was in Paris and Eminem was in Detroit, he was recording vocals there, people are on planes and buses. We were with, uh, I was with DJ Ali, uh, mixed by Ali, I should say, who's Kendrick Lamar's guy. Mm -hmm. And he's working on something interesting, but it was based on the fact that on the Good Kid, Mad City album, they did so much of it on the bus that if you listen really closely, you can hear the bus generator mm -hmm. in the record. Yeah. And it you know it starts to bleed into things mm -hmm. and stuff. Cool. So now I got to go back and listen to that stuff. So you see that trend. People... Because people are on the move. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And they want to multitask. Absolutely. And they move. can do it. Yeah, absolutely. It's not a problem anymore. Do you think the world is heading towards the mid-level studio as being the king? Uh, not taking it away from the big studios, but they should. Be, they have a place, and they're, they're going to be okay. Yeah. But it feels like like the, the, the bell curve has shifted more towards the mid-level studio. And if that's the case, what can a person or audience do to get prepared for that coming well, it's a, a lot of the home studio situations that are not necessarily these residential type situations I'm talking about, because that's a different animal. Mm -hmm. Right. But uh, if we categorize the home studios as places that are being used by other people besides just yeah. themselves that's to do I'm the work that they're level. doing. Yeah. Well, Low, mid -level. there aren't that many of them out there. Really. I mean, I've got a few for sure. I mean, that are very well equipped, like in the old days we had talked about. Uh, mm -hmm. the whole harp thing that had mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. uh, but there aren't that many high-end enough mid-level places that, let's Is say, there a need label for that? Uh, To some degree, but it, it, it's like because everybody can do everything in the box and everybody is an engineer now, mm -hmm. um, they just do it themselves a lot. It seems like the trend is like, yes, there's still a niche for that and we still do work with the mid-level stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, their studios around the corner from here that are like you know, five hundred dollar a day kind of places or whatever mm -hmm. that are uh, still keeping very busy there are less of them though than there were mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. which I was thinking about that earlier well, where's the growth area right now you know uh, well, obviously in this other area that I talked about mm -hmm. the destination places which we have all over the country not just here sure yeah. uh, there's an amazing one in Texas that we've done a lot of stuff with called Sonic Ranch that's like a two thousand mm -hmm. acre ranch Ooh, and, I know, go. done some pretty cool Can we stuff. shoot that <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> and um, Essentially, um, the mid-level stuff, people like that because, okay, I, I'm sitting at home and now I want to cut some drums. And I, I don't really want to do them in the bedroom because mm -hmm. I'd like to get a little better ambience. That's where I think the mid-level $500 places uh, are still so available. What does somebody have to do to get on your radar to help, to, to help well, them they have to have find a, clients? Uh, first of all, they have to present me what they are. I, I don't want to see pictures that are not... Are Accurate. you act well? I want to see a website that ah, it, that you've uh -huh. developed that has everything. That has your pictures. It has your dimensions. It has your equipment mm -hmm. list. Mm -hmm. Equipment's real important to me, even though everything's still in the box. Mm -hmm. I'm old school. Mm -hmm. well, I, I like to see. Popular. 
yeah, you know, I want to see high-end preamps, at least one or two, mm -hmm. you know. Gotcha. I want to see high-end mics, at least one or two. Because it sort of speaks to the quality of the place. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So if they don't really have that part together, if, you know, their best microphone is a $50 microphone, not to mention any names right. or whatever, and the same thing with the preamp is in a little whatever. Right. It's like, I know that they don't know enough about yeah. it to really be that able to... It would seem to me like, like one of the biggest impediments would be... Um, studios that are mostly started with one person uh, being in that room, like there's secret switches, there's hidden patches, there's hidden things you have to kick to make work, there's right. all these hidden things, whereas uh, I can go to any studio in the world that's, that's that we would consider major, I don't need any instructions, I just work instantly because right. it's, it's all set up the way we all do it. Right. And, and I guess that's kind of hard. If you've never experienced that, how do you know how, how do you to know set to up do? for it? Exactly. Is there, mm -hmm. a, is there a resource for that, like a, like a Bobby Ozinski book or something? I, I don't know of one. I, I think that really the people that are starting up on their own and trying to do it out of their house mm -hmm. and, and develop it need to try and get experience if they want to break into the next world. And, and experience you get from mm -hmm. working with other people that have already been there and done that. That, that dynamic never changes in what we do. Yeah. Yeah. At some point in time, no matter what the technology is, no matter what the evolution is, you need to have, I call it the analog training, right. so that you can exist in the digital world. Exactly, absolutely. And, and if you don't get that down, yeah. you're, you're gonna come up short one way or the other. Exactly. One of the offshoots I've seen, I've seen it, I've seen it with Dave, and we talked about it, is that the whole home studio notion Start out starts out as one thing, and oftentimes it evolves into another thing. Exactly. So yeah. it starts out as a convenient I thing. Do so it. My home well, that's what, was that's what he was saying. I just yeah. couldn't do it. <clears throat> so so, do tell so us that's what been the a whole is. other uh, mode of what we've been doing for the last probably 15, 20 years now. Yeah. Is that people have these home studios that they set up and they become successful mm -hmm. as producers, as artists, as engineers, whatever they're doing, and they find that they can't bring clients in because. You got the dog, you got the wife, you got yeah. the kids, whatever, interrupting yeah. the flow. Yep. And it becomes not professional enough for your own mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so what has come about is that we have a lot of people looking to lease facilities or buy facilities to get out of the house mm. and have a place that they can bring clients into comfortably mm -hmm. that feels more professional. And that's sort of like what the new mid-range is, I guess, that uh, you're discussing, Dave. You know, yeah. it, and like we have a lot of it. We have like 20-something yeah. leases going on in town now. Do you really? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Yeah. You, you, you kind of quickly went over something that I'd like to see. Does that hold true internationally? To, Pardon me? Does that hold true Oh, that is going on interna internationally. Okay, so I don't I do it personally that much, but, okay. I, I, but you see it everywhere. But I, I know it's happening internationally. You, you, you kind of briefly mentioned uh, a place where you can do drums. Um, seems like maybe that is an impediment to, to taking your home studio to the next level because you're going to have to convert your garage, you're going to have to soundproof it. But uh, but my point is that some genres, like the rock space, has different requirements in terms of the live stuff. And so, so if that's going to be your clientele, you, you've got to do a little more planning on having a live space, whereas if your genre is, is, is uh, folk music, then all you need is one mic and a acoustic well, guitar. Well, vocal booth or something, yeah. right. Yeah. We all need vocal booths yeah. of some sort. Right. Are you, how much film and TV and and mastering and uh, leasing and selling, are you getting... Are you all of the above. Oh, you know, okay. We really do all of the above. Yeah, I mean, it's like we've sold a bunch of studios. I mean, we sold Soundcastle, we sold way back to Josh mm -hmm. Abraham, Cherokee, uh, Encore, Craig Burbage we talked about, sure. the front page that yeah. he used to have us sold. Um, uh, God, Third Stone, which used to be Studio Sound Recorders, George wow. Tobin's old place. Amazing. Um, just... Lots of stuff. A lot of stuff. The layer. I'm yeah. sorry. The past, which yeah. was Larrabee, yeah. formerly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, not the one that you've been at, but yeah, right. the, the one. Larrabee West. Coenga, Larrabee yeah. West. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, or East was it East? East. Yes, yeah, that was yeah, East. West I think. was North Hollywood. Right. Right. No, West was um, West Hollywood. West Hollywood. Right. right. This was the one that was on Coenga. Yeah. There used to be Britannia yeah. ages ago, yeah. and then Tom. Was, what's um, it? Oh, Doug. No, Dave, Dave Way had it. Yeah. The guy that had Rack Attack. Oh. oh Oh, that was Tom, uh, no, not Tom, yeah. It was Doug, right? Doug Perry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he bought it after it was Britannia and rebuilt it and made it. Uh, that was a nice studio. Yeah, it was a great place. What's kind of sad and, then I sold and that interesting recently. is he yeah. just named some of the greatest facilities uh, ever in the world and they're selling. That's interesting. Well, but they, they're becoming, they're still studios. They just have new owners. 
Right, okay. right. They're you just know? being passed along. Yeah, absolutely. So in this in this notion of that transition, and when you take emerging genres of music, two things that we've talked about that I would assume are happening, and when you confirm for us or not, one is when people are moving into these other facilities, they don't necessarily need these facilities built out. They're either bringing their equipment or they... I primarily am dealing with ones that have been built out to some degree. Okay. okay. I'm not really dealing with, oh, here's a warehouse space over here by the airport that you can get inexpensively and go do a build out. Gotcha. Most of the people coming to me already are in business and need to continue moving gotcha. forth. So they bring in all their own equipment. Right. Mostly. Right. Some don't. Some right. need a... We, we lease out... Uh, I have one client who's a uh, major, major urban producer who mm -hmm. we've leased many facilities to. I mean, it's uh, no mm -hmm. ID. Sure. You know? Right. And I mean, like, we had him over at Sage and Sound initially, mm -hmm. both studios. Mm -hmm. We had him at Record One, both rooms. Mm -hmm. We had him over at what was Bay 7, became Meg Megawatt. Mm. And now I have him over at uh, United in mm. one of their rooms mm. for years. And so, so he's some bringing people, his stuff. No. Oh, he the, had, that stuff that particular there. type of level of people. They have, they want they fully equipped facility. That's a yeah. fully equipped facility that they're walking into. Right. Yeah. It, it's. But have you have others that. The majority of people are the lower budget kind of thing where they're spent, they want to spend a thousand to three thousand dollars a month for a place that they can move into. Gotcha. And they don't need the equipment. They've got their rig and they've got their monitors and their pre's and whatever, and they just move into the space within another studio possibly got or it. whatever type of situation it is. And Do you get requests from the EDM space? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, we've done a lot of stuff with like Skrillex mm. and uh, Cascade and oh, cool. Diplo, all that. You know, it's just yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, right? musically we tossing off names. <laughs> yeah. no. Skrillex, yeah. Cascade, yeah. Diplo. Yeah. You know, just just easy things. Um, the the indie mm -hmm. side of the business, um, which people are self sufficient, self generating, trying to do it themselves, probably a boon to your business in some ways. It, it doesn't bit. hurt, certainly. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, they still need. Because I think you get to a point and then you want to go to the next level. Right. A little bit. And right. that's where you would come in and help with whatever the next level is based on pricing. Right, exactly. Exactly. Got Whatever it. they can swing, basically. Wow. Where's all this going? I mean, I mean, are we going to be recording in our cars soon? Or? I'm, you can. <laughs> <laughs> You've got internet of, en enabled cars right now, right? You know, it's just. Oh, uh, thank ma you. No, make a record. <laughs> oh, that's right here. <laughs> you can do that but, now. But the it's bottom true. line is there's still the big artists want to be catered yeah. okay it's just like if if you're established and you've been doing this a long time you like to have it's just like a nice hotel okay right. you want to be someplace that's comfortable that mm -hmm. you're catered to that you yeah. know has got great the acoustics definitely have, have different needs than than a, a an up-and-coming artist in fact i guess yeah. producers like and writers have a, a different need too. They oh, can, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It's hmm. a, everybody has their little niche. I mean, it's just. Uh, but you don't see the you don't see the, the 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 big major studios like Conway, Larrabee, Record Plant. Are they on the are the, are they increasing? Or are they on the decline? I think they're as far oh. as the volume of places around, oh, or income. as far as business. Oh, income. I yeah. think that they're hanging in there. I think they're hanging why, in there why largely. Why you say hanging in there? Well, I mean, doing well. well, I mean, it's not like the old days where it was just out of control. Everybody had to use them. Yeah, okay? oh, yeah. I mean, you know, the '80s and '90s and early 2000s. Back then, like, the average budget was like what, Herb, 250 grand least, per record? Yeah, yeah. just for studio. Yeah. yeah, plenty so, of them. So, so tell us what the majors are. are looking the majors at are still working with these high-end artists. Yeah. Okay, that want to be at these places. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think we talked about uh, Limp Biscuit being over at yeah. uh, Larrabee. I mean, I brought yeah. them there five years ago. And they they're still there. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's like I think uh, that was Lincoln Park. Was Lincoln Park. Oh, I'm sorry, Lincoln, Lincoln Park. Park. Yes, right. I'm sorry. Yeah. Limp Biscuit was NRG actually. I yeah, yeah. I always get my L's confused. Well, we should Alaska. talk a little bit about NRG yeah. when yeah. you get in, sure. in a minute. Yeah. And so um, let's see where, where we were talking about uh, these majors, how they're maintaining. And, and oftentimes, the, what's being maintained is the fact that some of these major artists have their own budgets. Right. Absolutely. And, and they can sort of dictate what they what needs to happen. Right. It's Absolutely. not always label driven. Yeah. Today. And, and I think a lot of the really big ones, especially if we're not talking, what no, it, it's is genre not specific really right. because a lot of the urban acts like to be in these cool places because yeah. they like the yep. catering too. They it's do. like you know. Yep. And uh, so it's not genre specific, but to a degree. It's all about the sound. Mm -hmm. And these, no matter what you do at most home studios, there's obviously a few exceptions, but the majority of the big places, you know, the mm -hmm. East, West, the United, the Conway, the A&M, Henson, mm -hmm. whatever, these places have acoustics that 
are just phenomenal. Mm. And, and when you walk into those rooms, you hear your voice and it's different than if mm. you're sitting in your bedroom That's or your, your living room or whatever. That's true. And it, it's, it's a part of why they're still there and why yeah. they will be there. That I don't see sense. them going away. And you asked about mm. TVs and film and mm -hmm. stuff, whatever. I mean, we, do, um, we did all the Mad Men series for years. Was a, the composer was a guy named David Carbonara, still mm. hero, obviously, mm -hmm. who we did all the Mad Men shows, um, which would be... When you said recording. you did, you found him... We set them all, all the studios up all the time whenever he Would these that. be recording mm. studios? All or, recording or, studios. Or video facilities? Recording or, studios. But you yeah. don't get into renting video facilities or anything? Not no. per se. We do video shoots what about a right? lot. Post and stuff? Um, doesn't get that much demand oh, from yeah. people that are calling me. I think people look at me as being the audio guy. Right. Uh, okay. Because of, between my background and the yeah. history. Sure. But... Uh, We've done it. It's just not something that comes along that often. As you, a request. you know, those those every at the end of every year, right before the new year, you see these um, these little films that are like the the year in one minute. Mm -hmm. Can you give me NRG in one minute, like the, like one of those little? I'll fast try films? to do it in a minute. Yeah. Uh, okay. I want, yeah. The reason I want you yeah. to do this is I want the guys, yeah. I want I want our viewers to hear going from a, a little tiny place to a major facility in sixty seconds. Go. Okay. So we. Initially, NRG was in a house in North Hollywood, I think it was on Cleon, and uh, the way it started was his mother, Jay's mother, had called me wanting to get his, her son a 24-track machine, mm -hmm. so back in 82 or 3 or whatever, and they got it, and they moved it into this little house. It was called Alpha Studios before they were there. Mm. Prince actually did 1999 there. Well, that was my going? 60 seconds doing, wow. and I brought them their first client, which was a guy named Thomas Dolby. Huh. Okay, Thomas huh. Dolby did a ton of stuff there, made them money, then they grew in, grew out of the place into what is their current facility, which, I'm, yeah, that's that, mm. uh, was Weddington Studios. Mm. And while there, we brought him, uh, John Silva's a great client of mine, uh, mm. Silva Artist Management. Sure. We brought them, um, uh, God, Red Cross, House of Freaks, all this earlier mm -hmm. stuff oh, that stuff. Uh, then became big clients at NRG. Wow. And as I said, Lincoln, Limp Biscuit Limp also Biscuit. over okay. NRG. Yeah. And so, and these clients stayed for years, some of these people. You know, mm. The Biscuit especially. Was so it can be like done. Yeah. It can be done. Absolutely, from a house to... That's amazing. Tell me what you got in the corner office for our guest. Got some good questions. This first one's from Jake Woodford. If an unexperienced band comes to you looking to book studio time, how are you guide them through the process when they may not know exactly what they want or need? It's a lot about questioning them what they're going to be doing. Is this something that they're looking to release themselves? Is it something that they are just shopping around to try and mm. get gigs with mm -hmm. or to sell on the road. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a lot of it. What kind of music they're doing uh, plays into it. Obviously, uh, budget plays a big role. Yeah. And we then, from answer, getting those answers, we ascertain what might work best for them. You can come up with it. Give us another one, Chunker. This is from Andy Rhoda. What are some of the biggest unforeseen details of booking stewards that most people wouldn't be aware of? Oh, good question. Um, well, one thing that unfortunately is falling by the wayside a lot is engineer. Uh, a lot of people think because they can run Pro Tools that they're an engineer. Uh, and if you're going into a real studio, you need an engineer or you have to be one. Yeah. Okay. And it's really sad that that's becoming like a lost art, I mm. think, because people are thinking, oh, the assistant can get us running and we'll figure it out. But the results, a lot of times, are disastrous yeah. on that. Just to be fair, a lot of the major facilities, their engineers are really good. Their assistants, you mean? Yeah, assistants. Oh, yeah. they are. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But, but it's, a lot of them aren't it's unfair good. to them to have them become the engineer on your session and not pay them properly also. Yeah. Oh, good point. Yeah. Okay? That, that's and that's a, a big issue. Yeah. Did I answer that question? Yeah. No, let's see. Yeah. Every yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, I, I don't know if I get the depth of that one. Well, no, that I mean, I, 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 you've done a great job. Cool. Um, I, I, I made one blunder when I mentioned a lot of great studios. I forgot Candace and East West. Oh, of course. Sorry, Candace, please don't Absolutely. hurt me. Absolutely, who we use constantly. Um, okay. So now it's you've got the business established. It's where it is. I feel like there's sort of a resurgence just in a new way of capturing what we do, converting it to other things. Mm -hmm. I think that audio, you know, we alluded at the top of the show to audio being used in 3D printing. Like audio, the way we describe it is audio is the one discipline that cuts across everything. Right. It's, it, it's very hard to do anything without audio sure. involved. absolutely. And you have to go to people who are experts at it to sort of figure out how to capture it, what to do with it, and all that kind of stuff. So as you move forward, do you just sort of stay abreast of trends and see where 
it may work for your service? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been a member of AES for years. Sure. And, and uh, you know, yeah, absolutely. Naris and all that. Absolutely. And, and I'm involved in... Shout out to Bob Moses. There you go. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, so I, I stay on top of things as oh, best I can. really cool. Yeah. Although my engineering chops at this point... If you put a Pro Tools rig in front of me right now, I don't think I could do it. That's okay, because you're, you're, <laughs> you're building a business chops. It's just fine. I, I had, I hope you don't mind this. Oh, thank you. What, you allergic to black people? <laughs> Let's hope <laughs> not. Because you, because We're in trouble. You, 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 your career would have to be rescinded. Um, I had bounced some stuff about Fab Factory. Uh, oh, cool. Uh, at Ellis. Mm -hmm. uh, Fab Factory being the facility that we're opening up soon, with, uh, which will be... House of Dave, mm -hmm. um, and I think he thought the way we were approaching it and trying to do some innovative things with it and also some innovative things for manufacturers and, and hardware folks and software folks as well as potentially how we make it a hub. Mm -hmm. um, did, th did those things make sense to you? Oh, very they much? did, absolutely, yeah. yeah. No question. Oh, yeah. good, because I, I, I was testing. Talk about a niche. There's another little niche. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that... Touched on a lot of little... Um, yes. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Here comes a lesson. <laughs> when, when have you ever had an idea that wasn't great? Well, no. Uh, I mean, why are, I just don't why are you testing your ideas I just now? don't tell you about the failures. That's all. <laughs> there, there's some clunkers out there. Um, and you, you, hopefully you don't mind us being able to utilize. I mean, I, I had lunch with, with Ellis and, mm -hmm. and our partner in Fab Factories. Mm -hmm. And I called Dave immediately afterwards and said, he's got to do the show. Oh, yeah. Like I was doing a service for the other guys, but I was like, I was so compelled at the stories and the mm -hmm. evolution and the need for the service and how much it's evolved. It's, it's, it's truly amazing. Um, Thank you. And, and the notion that you can be international and sit at home right. and sort of do all that kind of stuff. Same with us with mixing. And so of course, so absolutely. It's just, it's, yeah. just it's, an, it's an amazing time to be where we are. One of the things I'd love to ask you, if you would, is I think the audience, as Chongo was saying earlier, often needs this information um, because guys are making fiscal decisions at that point in time when they may not have a lot of money right. or they need to set something up that'll work in the future. And, you know, we go around and we speak a lot live and we do a lot of educational panels. Be really interesting, maybe, to have you join us on one. Would you do that? Sure, absolutely. Be glad oh, that'd to. Be It'd be really yeah. cool, yeah. right? Yeah, you guys were so busy at the NAM show, I couldn't even get to the booth. It's <laughs> <That's> a good <laughs> problem. Huge crowd there. Well, you know what? We, we, as Dave and I are doing that, I don't yeah. know. We've shared this a couple of times. We've been there now four years, mm -hmm. and we don't think it's. We call it sold out until we see fire marshals. Right. And so when we see them going through with walkie-talkies, Dave, we hit each other. Sold out. Larry, the fire yeah. marshal. Exactly. Oh, they know the kids. Way. Yeah, <laughs> we actually had like a, a, a I don't know if usher is the right word, but we had a guy who kind of loped up on people, and he was because I got complaints afterwards. This guy right, pushed right. me to the back. They have to clear it. So I remember that was happening. So after all these guys were standing back against the wall like that. Was, was happening in the aisle behind it. Was. Yeah, exactly. I, I was one of those guys. That oh pushed no! Back. Yeah. I wish you should have waved. Uh, probably upset. You got juice. Think, <laughs> I think a couple of years ago, Cole stole his like cart and was driving it around the facility. Cole Chalmers. <laughs> yeah, Cole Chalmers. We have video of it. Poor guy didn't have his little golf cart. Well, the guys running after them, and they're like, ah, we're behind us. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, a very enlightened time. Uh, first of many, you have to come back. My pleasure. Glad and to. And yeah. we'll do some live stuff, don't you think, that we should do some live stuff with Ellis? I do fully. You do? Yes. Okay, will you make the arrangements and do the booking, please? Yes. Okay. Uh, he flies first class. Okay. Absolutely. And he has to stay at certain kind of hotels. I'm just going to call the Ellis of the travel agent crowd. <laughs> Which is probably me. <laughs> Get all that worked out. Bro. Pleasure, man. Man, listen, we, we see each other so much over time. And as much as I've used the service and known of you, I didn't know it, like right. having that much. history kind of. And it is really fascinating, man. Well, and thank you. Do you have competition? Well, not really, no. There have been several people that tried over the yeah. years. There was a company in New York called Time Capsule okay. back in probably 83 or 84. But they didn't have a, one person like myself that was the guy. Mm -hmm. They had like assistant engineers that were out of work that mm -hmm. they hired to become me. And didn't, it just didn't cut can't it. Do it. Yeah, can't you do needed it. the sort of the expert advice yeah. kind of. And there are some people in Europe kind of doing it too, mm -hmm. uh, that have their own network of studios that they sort of manage also, which I don't uh, really manage the studios gotcha. per se, except for one or two here. Mm -hmm. um, and only those are because they're clients that are 
like Raphael Sadiq, for sure. instance, I sold in his place. So right. if he has me do something. Not far from him. here. Not around the corner, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Shout out to Ray and yeah. his manager. Absolutely. Damien. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Ellis, thank you. We're going to be back at you. You got DP, it. DP, why don't you take us home? Um, I was sitting there thinking, as always, uh, well, not as always, but um, I'm, I'm going to share four, four points, hopefully, maybe one or two more, but at least four. One, um, technology has leveled the playing field so much that if you whine and complain and bitch and moan about not being able to make it, look in the mirror and you'll see the problem. Technology has made it possible for you to do anything you want to do. Um, there's, there's hope for all of us to go to another level, particularly the cats that are just coming into the business with their home facility. Uh, one of the things I took away from listening to Ellis is, is you now can do it. You have the tools to do it that didn't exist t 10, 15 years ago. The other thing is um, the future and the control of your career is now in your hands. You don't have to worry about a studio owner controlling your future or a producer or a label. You control your own future, so your future is, is very bright. Take advantage of that. And lastly, and the coolest part of I took away from Ellis is that engineers still matter. That was the greatest thing he said, and I think one of the truest things he said. Absolutely, because I don't and, have a career if and, you don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the reason that's so important is because those of you that want to be an engineer, your future looks really good, too. So uh, rewind this, check it out. There was a lot of little in-depth things that might have slid past you without you, you knowing that they're very good tidbits. So we'll see you next week. Audio matters. See you guys.